Hey guys, it's Miss Simpson and it's time for a reading today. Today we are going to be talking about point of view. So point of view is when different narrators can tell about the same event in a different way. We have read a total of three novels this year and we are reading Gregor the Overlander right now, but there are in these three novels, they were written all from different perspectives. So you have a choice. Don't look at this one down here, but you have a choice between first person and third person. So first person is when the narrator is in the story. They are a character in the story. So for example, Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing that we read at the very, very beginning of the year, this had a narrator in the story. So remember, we saw things Dr. Brown thanked me for helping him. My mother made another appointment for fudge. The nurse kissed my brother and we left. It was all from Peter's perspective. He was the one telling the story and he was in the story in Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing. We saw words like I, me, my, we. That tells us first person. So this one is first person and the narrator is Peter because Peter is in the story. Now, let's take a look at Frindle. Frindle, we have, Nick and Janet had missed the bus. Um, they got back on the curb. Nick followed Janet, putting one foot. See, let's flip forward. There are a lot of names in this book. This book is actually third person. The narrator is not a part of the story. So Nick in this book was being talked about, it says his name, Nick, 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 a lot. In this book, it didn't say Peter a lot because Peter was telling the story. And if he just said Peter went to the store and Peter, he'd be talking about himself in a weird way, right? Nick isn't the one telling the story. Somebody is telling the story about Nick. So this one is third person, and it is a narrator that's not part of the story. We don't know who the narrator is. The narrator could be a person at school. The narrator could be a reporter. The narrator could be just about anybody besides Nick. So then we read How to Steal a Dog. How to Steal a Dog was a super cute book, but I pushed through the stickers. I opened the box. I poked Toby. This How to Steal a Dog is written in first person. Georgina is the one telling the story. She is the narrator, and she's also a part of the story. So I want you to think about Gregor the Overlander, what we have read so far. What point of view is Gregor the Overlander told from? I see a lot of his name. Gregor would have been more concerned I don't see a lot of eyes. It says he, which we see he, she, they. Um, that gives us maybe third person, but I'm going to read chapter eight today. And your job while I'm reading chapter eight is to figure out, is it first person or third person? If it is first person or third person, whichever one, I want you to think about who the narrator is. So if it's first person, the narrator would be Gregor. But if it's third person point of view, the narrator is somebody outside of the story. So who do you think is telling the story? You're just going to have to take not necessarily a guess, an educated guess. But who do you think? What are your thoughts on that one? So again, I'm going to read chapter eight. Your job the whole time is to figure out, is it first person or third person? And who is the narrator in this story? So let's go ahead and let's start. We ended chapter seven. Um, oh my gosh, I remember he escaped. He escaped the palace and he's going down the river and people are screaming his name and he's in a canoe and Boots is asleep on his back. It's like whitewater rafting. And he hears his name continue to be called and he steps out. He got his, his boat, his canoe to the shore. He steps out to try and run a little bit more and hide in the cave and what does he bump into? A gigantic rat. Guys, a gigantic rat. He bumped into a gigantic rat. <laughs> Nasty. Okay, let's go ahead and let's read chapter eight. Ah, here you are at last, said the rat idly. By your reek, we expected you ages ago. Look, Fanger, he's brought the pup. A long nose poked over the first rat's shoulder. It had a friend. 
What a tidbit she is, said Finger in a smooth, rich voice. I will allow you the entire boy if I may have the sweetness of the pup to myself shed. It is tempting, but he is more than bone more bone than meat and she is such a morsel said shed i find myself quite torn by your offer stand you boy and let us better tell your stuffing the cockroaches had been freaky the bats intimidating but these rats were purely terrifying sitting back on their haunches they were a good six feet tall and their legs arms whatever you called them bulged with muscle under their gray fur but the worst part of all was their teeth six inch incisors that protruded out of their whiskered mouths. No, the worst part was that they were clearly planning to eat Gregor and Boots. Some people thought rats didn't eat people, but Gregor knew better. Even the regular sized rats back home would attack a person if they were helpless. Rats preyed on babies, old people, the weak, the defenseless. There were stories, the homeless man in the alley, a little boy who'd lost two fingers. They were too horrible to think about. Gregor slowly got to his feet, retrieving the torch, but keeping it down at his side. He pressed boots back against the cavern wall. Finger's nose quivered. This one had fish for supper, mushrooms, grain, and just a bit of leaf. Now that's flavorful, you must admit, Shed. But the pup has gorged on stewed cow and cream, returned Shed. Not to mention she's clearly milk fed herself. Now, Gregor knew what all the fuss about bathing had been. If the rats could detect the handful of greens he'd eaten hours earlier, they must have been unbelievable sense of smell. The underlanders hadn't been rude. Hadn't been rude when they'd wanted him to bathe. They had been trying to keep him alive. He went from attempting to evade them to wishing desperately that they'd find him. He had to hold the rats off. It would give him time. The expression startled him. Vicus had said killing him would give the roaches no time. By time, did the Anderlander simply mean more life? He brushed off his clothes and tried to adopt the rat's casual banter. Do I have any say in this? He asked. To his surprise, Finger and Shed laughed. He speaks, said Shed. What a treat. Usually we get nothing but shrieks and whimpers. Tell us, Overlander, what makes you so brave? Oh, I'm not brave, said Gregor, but you can smell that. Bet you can smell that. The rats laughed again. True, your sweat carries much fear, but still you managed to address us. Well, I thought you might like to get to know your meal better, said Gregor. I like him, Shed, howled Fang. Fanger. I like him too, choked Shed. The humans are commonly most dreary. Say we may keep him, Fanger. Oh, Shed. How is that to be? It would entail much explaining. And besides, all this laughter gives me hunger, said Finger. And me, said Shed. But you must agree to eat such amusing prey as great pity. A great pity, Shed, said Finger. But without remedy, shall we? And with that, both rats bared their teeth and moved in on him. Gregor slashed at them with the torch, sending a trail of sparks through the air. He held it in front of him with both hands like a sword, fully illuminating his face. The rats pulled up short. Uh, at first, he thought they were afraid of the flame, but it was something more. They looked stunned. Mark you, Shed, his shade, said Finger in a hushed voice. I mark it, Finger, said Shed quietly. And he is but a boy. Think you he is? He is not if we kill him, Finger growled, and he lunged for Gregor's throat. The first bat came in so silently that neither Gregor nor the preoccupied rat saw it. It caught Finger mid-leap, knocking him off course. Finger plowed into Shed and the rats slanted in a heap. Instantly, they regained their feet and turned on their assailants. Gregor saw Henry, Merith, and Perdita zigzagging their bats above the rats' heads. Besides avoiding one another in limited space, they had to dodge the wicked claws of the rats. Finger and Shed could easily leap 10 feet in the air and the sparkling ceiling of the cavern over the beach was not much higher. The humans began to dive at the rats, wielding swords. Finger and Shed fought back viciously with claws and teeth. Blood began to stain the, bin the beach, but Gregor couldn't tell whose it was. Flee, Henry shouted at Gregor as he whipped past him. Flee, Overlander. Part of him wanted to, 
badly, but he couldn't. First of all, he had no idea where to go. His boat was high on the beach and the tunnel. Well, he'd rather take his chances in the open than in the tunnel if he had to deal with the rats. More important, he knew the underlanders were only here because of him. He couldn't just run away and leave them to face the rats. But what could he do? At that moment, Shed caught the wing of Maris Bat in her teeth and hung on. The bat struggled to free itself, but Shed head held fast. Perdita came in behind Shed, taking off his ear with one stroke of her sword. Shed gave a howl of pain, re releasing Maris Bat. But as Perdita pulled out of her dive, Fanger leaped onto her bat, ripping a chunk of fur off its a chunk of fur off its throat and hurling her to the ground. Perdita hit her head on the cavern wall as she landed and was knocked out. Fanger loomed over her and aimed his teeth at her neck. Gregor didn't remember thinking of his next move. It just happened. One minute he was pressed against the wall and the next he jumped forward and thrust his torch into Fanger's face. The rat shrieked and stumbled backwards right into Henry's sword. Fanger's lifeless body fell to the ground, taking the sword with him. Fanger's shriek finally woke Boots, who took one look over Gregor's shoulder and began wailing at the top of her lungs. Her cries echoed off the wall, sending Shed into a fren frenzy and disorienting the bats. How fly you, Merith? yelled Hillary. We can hold, cried Merith, although his bat was spraying blood from its wounded wing. Things didn't look good. Merith's bat was losing control. Henry was unarmed. Perdita was unconscious. Her bat was gras gasping for air on the ground. Boots was screeching and Shed was insane with pain and fear. Though bleeding badly, he had lost none of his speed or strength. Merritt was trying to desperately to keep the rat from Perdita, but he was just one guy. Henry flew interference, but he couldn't get in too close without a sword. Gregor crouched over Perdita, holding the torch. It seemed a fragile defense against the crazed Shed, but he had to do something. Mm -hmm. Then Shed leaped, catching Merith's bat by the feet. The bat slammed into the wall, and so did Merith. The rat turned on Gregor. Now you die! screamed Shed. Boots screamed back in terror as Shed lunged at them. Gregor braced himself, but Shed never made it. Instead, the rat let out a gasp and pawed at the blade that jutted through its throat. Gregor caught a glimpse of Lux's bat, Aurora, flipping upright. He had no idea when she'd arrived. Luxa must have been flying completely upside down when she'd stabbed Shed. Even though Luxa had flattened herself on the bat's back, Aurora barely managed to pull out of the maneuver without scraping her off on the ceiling. Shed slumped back against the cavern wall, but there was no fight left in him. His eyes burned into Gregor's. Overlander, he gurgled. We hunt you to the last rat. And with that, he died. Gregor had only a moment to catch his breath before Henry landed beside him. Pushing Gregor out onto the beach, he lifted Perdita in his arms and took off yelling. Scorch the land! Blood pouring down his face from a gash on his forehead. Merith was already wrenching the swords from Shed and Fanger. He dragged the rats into the river and it quickly carried their bodies away. His bat shakily regained the use of its wings and he hurled, hurtled onto its back. Merith caught Boots' backpack and hoisted Gregor onto his stomach in front of him. Gregor saw Aurora, Aurora hook her clawed feet into the fur at the shoulders of Perdita's injured bat. Luxa had at some point retrieved the oil lamp from the boat. As I rose into the air, she smashed it onto the ground. Drop the torch, yelled Merith, and Gregor managed to straighten his fingers, releasing it. The last thing he saw as they darted out of the cavern was the beach bursting into flame. And that's the end of chapter eight. Woo, that was a heavy one. So Gregor ran into some bats as he's trying to escape. And basically what happened was he was going to get killed by the bats until the underlanders came and saved him. There was a bloody bath. There was a very bad battle. They fought and they fought and bats are hurt. Humans are hurt, but both of the rats ended up dying and everybody is getting home safely except for the rats. So that's a good thing. But he said they will hunt Gregor down. Every last rat will hunt him down. So that's a little scary for Gregor because now he's on the run. All of these bats in the whole entire Underland are basically on his tail, right? Because they, um, they probably know that their friends just got killed. And not a very good death either. They got killed in battle. So after reading that, what do you think the point of view is of Gregor the Overlander? Do you think Gregor is telling the story from his point of view? 
Or do you think somebody on the outside of the story is telling you the story who's not in it? I'm going to tell you one thing. Gregor's name was mentioned a lot. Normally when the book is in first person, their name isn't mentioned all that often. So I also saw she, he, they, him, and her quite a bit. So I want you to tell me what you think the point of view is, first person or third person, on Flipgrid, and also tell me why you think that. So what do you think the point of view is of our book, and why do you think that? And you're going to do this on Flipgrid. And when you're done, just turn it in. All right, guys, I love you all so much. Have a great day.